OK. Um, we're transitioning over to um, multiple choice topics, but really we're kind of going back to what we did um, when we were uh, that week from the week before spring break, uh, you know, hitting all these uh, first semester topics again, uh, but then from a specifically from a multiple choice perspective. Um, so um, we're going to be going through multiple choice um, throughout this entire week. So I think um, we'll dedicate um, today, tomorrow, and probably a little bit of Friday just to derivative topics. And then Monday and Tuesday, uh, we can focus on integral topics. And then your quiz will be Wednesday, Thursday. OK, um, you know, all of next week is going to be shortened because of um, EOCs. Um, but it's going to be Tuesday and Friday that will be impacted the most. These are the days that will be uh, even shorter um, because the EOCs are longer. But uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, I think we're going to have um, at least 30 minutes per class period. So uh, at least we'll have that 30 minute period for us to to work on our tests that I'm splitting into into, um, into, into two days. So eight questions, um, eight multiple choice questions per, per day for a 30 minute period. Okay. Okay. Um, after that, uh, we only have one week remaining uh, before your AP exam. Your AP exam is May 9th on Monday. Uh, I want to circle back to FRQs. And um, all the free response questions are released um, um, for, for, for anyone to, to look at. So we're going to, we're going to practice through um, free response questions for the most recent years. Um, now, anything that we don't finish in class, there's six FRQs, whatever we don't finish in class, you'll do for homework, but there's no penalty for any late um, homework because um, you know students are in and out. Um, so, um, but as, as long as you show it to me um, before the school year ends, uh, you'll get, um, uh, this will go towards a full um, uh, quiz grade. Um, but ideally, uh, you can keep up and then you can at least look at and work through most of these problems. Um, so I think this will be really beneficial leading up to the AP exam, you know, seeing as many free response questions um, that you can. Um, just to kind of give you some um, frame of reference in terms of free response questions, there's usually there's going to be six FRQs, and these are the major topics that show up on FRQs. Now, sometimes they may find ways to insert a topic into another FRQ, uh, but here are the major six um, that that uh, that typically show up. There's going to be a usually antiderivative word problem. This is where uh, from um, uh, like rate in, rate out, um, similar to um, the problems that we've seen recently, or um, when I introduced the problem involving uh, sand on the beach. Right there's uh, initially some amount of sand on the beach, the tide is taking it away, but there's a machine that's pumping um, sand onto the beach and trying to figure out, you know, a lot of times EVT will come into play using that formula. Um, initial or final amount equals initial plus amount added minus amounts of amount removed. So that type of problem, um, we'll probably get to see some of that uh, that week before um, the AP exams. Riemann sums, you've seen quite a bit recently. Derivative graphs, uh, we've also seen, we've also practiced through that quite a bit. Related rates, we may not have seen them quite as much, um, so uh, we'll probably um, do a little bit more with related rates, FRQs, before your AP exam. Uh, but sometimes it's related rates um, inserted into like a part C or D of a problem. That's what I've seen more recently. It's not a full related rates problem, but they're able to to fill in the related rates portion within one of the FRQs. Uh, miscellaneous, uh, a lot of times miscellaneous um, are problems where you have a table and you're asked to do like product rule, chain rule, quotient rule, things like that. Particle motion, sometimes particle motion is its own uh, FRQ. Um, okay. And then differential equations, um, you just saw that on your quiz yesterday. So I really want to, I really practice that with you guys because I'm, I'm pretty sure that's going to show up on the AP exam. So I want us to be comfortable with that type of problem. Area volume, you guys did really well on this um, for the test, but I know we probably need to review. It's been a little bit, it's been a while since the chapter seven test, since we've seen area volume. 
But this method, washer method, um, cross section, um, we'll do a little bit of review with that. Um, look at some FRQs, but typically um, students are pretty strong uh, with area volume um, in terms of um, being comfortable with that topic. Um, FRQs is uh, the first two questions will be will be calculator, and then the remaining four will be non-calculator. Um, sometimes they may kind of mix these problems around, but typically I see uh, it's the antiderivative and the Riemann sums being the um, being the uh, calculator question, and then the next four being non-calculator. But they can always you know, they've always swap you know swap them before, and um, it's no guarantee, but at least. That's typically the pattern from the past. OK. All right, so let's look at your packets. OK, so today um, we're going to be focusing on. OK, so. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, today, tomorrow, and Friday, we'll focus on mainly derivative topics. Let me just kind of run through those derivative topics. Um, OK, with you here. Okay, so this will be topics of uh, one through one through eleven. Okay, those are going to be your um, your major derivative topics. So limits, continuity, L'Hopital's rule, product chain quotient rule. We'll focus on those two topics today. Um, implicit differentiation theorems. A lot of times, EBT, mean value theorem, Rolle's theorem, related rates, derivative graph. Uh, first derivative test, test for concavity. Second derivative test. Particle motion, position, velocity, acceleration, trig, and uh, natural log derivatives, and then derivative of inverse at a point. Very specific. I'll go over these problems with us. Um, right, from this, uh, this, not Friday, then Monday, and then linear approximation. So those are your major topics. Um, so we'll spend today through Wednesday, Friday uh, going through those topics. And then the remaining topics we'll probably do Monday. And Tuesday of next week, Riemann sums, trapezoid approximation, integration rules such as use substitution, bond division, arc trig. Um, I can also say um, synthetic division here as well. Uh, first theorem, second theorem, average value theorem, solving differential equations, slope fields, area volume, such as uh, disk washer and cross section. Okay. Um, I've attached the uh, formula sheets. I'll let you guys use the formula sheet on your multiple choice uh, quizzes next week. But I want to kind of keep reminding us that this is not provided on the AP exam. OK, you're not given any formulas on the AP exam. I want to give this to you in the hopes that you will continue to look at it and eventually commit them to to memory. So I think um, if you were to, you know, um, but Definitely, you know, use this as you're going through the review, as you're going through the multiple choice review. And um, but uh, you want to eventually commit uh, all these uh, topics and formulas to to memory. I typically try to put um, the first semester topics on the first page and second semester topic on the second page. But because of space, some of the things um, uh, I kind of had to fit where where it could fit. Okay. So. Definitely take time to look over it, read through it, and um, and see if you can, you know, little by little, um, be able to commit to memory. Uh, maybe I'll I'll spend uh, a class period or a portion of a class period um, that week before um, AP exams, where I list out the major formulas and then see if you guys can 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 fill them in. Okay, not for a grade, but just to see where you're at, and, and um, if you can fill that in, then you can. You have the idea that you're pretty close to where you should be for uh, Mondays, but if you're having trouble. Um, um, uh, finding or uh, recalling those those uh, those formulas, then um, then you at least have, have an idea what you want to do to get ready for in terms of what you need to, to memorize and know for 
for that Monday for that AP exam. Okay, any questions about uh, the calendar? Okay, and I'm also going to spend. Um, uh, so your your uh, quizzes will be Wednesday, Thursday. I'm going to spend this Friday, the 29th. Um, really going over all the details about your AP exam so you know exactly uh, the formats uh, and I'll, I'll give you the format. I'll give you all the information. I'll also give you a lot of tips involving um, uh, what to expect on, on the AP exam in terms of the format. So uh, we'll spend this Friday, uh, next Friday, kind of going over all the all the, the, the important details uh, of your AP exam experience. OK. OK. So let's look at number one. Okay, so the graph of function f is shown above. At what value is the function continuous but not differentiable? So we're looking for a portion of the graph that's connected, but not differentiable. So not differentiable means not a smooth curve. And what I'm, that also means is that um, unable to find derivative or slope. OK, so which do you think is the best candidate for this year? A, B, C, D, or E? You see a point that's not part of a smooth curve. A, yeah. So A, continuous because there's no breaks, but you can't find the slope at a sharp turn. Okay. B is, a, is not continuous, so that, that doesn't match that uh, condition. C, C is a part of a continuous and a smooth curve. D is, um, it's a disconnected graph, right? So this is a non-removable or a jump discontinuity. And then E is part of a continuous function. So yeah, so only A. Okay, let's take a look at number two. We have a piecewise function here. Uh, it's asking us uh, which of the following statements is true. And here it's all asking about continuity and um, discontinuity. So I want to review um, uh, continuity conditions with you. Okay. So continuity conditions is where uh, we have to go through three conditions, and we're trying to show, um, based off the continuity conditions, whether the graph is continuous, whether there is a jump discontinuity, or whether there is a whole discontinuity. So let me go through each of the conditions here, and the conditions is spelled out on page 23. Okay. Here it is, continuity condition. So the first condition is, does a point exist? Second condition is, does the limit exist? And third condition, does the limit agree where the point is? So let's go through each of the three conditions here. Okay. I want to kind of point out some things about this uh, piecewise function. This first condition is saying that this graph exists everywhere except at two. So this is where the graph is. Okay, The graph is going to be connected all the way through except at two. So this is where the graph lives based off of this restriction for the first piecewise. The second is not really a graph. The second is really just a what? It's just a point. OK, so we don't want to be doing. Yeah, so we want to we don't we're not thinking of this as two potentially disconnected graph It's more like one graph. And then that point may or may not be filled in by this second 
um, if piece of information. Okay. So let's go through each of our conditions here. Okay, so continuity conditions. Okay, so first condition, f of two. We know the point in question is two, so we're going to find f of two. F of two is defined for the second piecewise, so f of two equals seven. Second condition. Uh, does the limit exist? So um, we know that we just have to worry about this first function here because it's the same function on either side of two. So there's no need for one side of limit. We only do one side limit if we have two different graphs on either side of two, but this is telling us that this first expression is covering both sides of two. So we'll do the limit. Okay, so how do we evaluate the limit if it's approaching a real number? What's the first thing we always do? Plug in, right? Plug in, see what we get. So plug in two in for x, two times four is eight, eight minus six is two, two minus two is zero. All right, so first thing we do is we always plug in and we do get zero over zero. What does that tell us? about what's happening with the graph here. There, there's a hole, right? And if there's a hole, does the limit still exist? Yes, okay, we just haven't found it yet, okay? So there's two options here. You can either go through factoring and cancel out, or you can go through what's another option that we can use? Um, toss, right? So two options here. Um, so you can either, so let, me, let me go through um, both, both of them. Both options, you can choose which one you want to do. If I want to factor and cancel out, I can factor the numerator. If I can cancel, reevaluate, I get plug in two, two times two is four, four plus one is five. Another option is L'Hopital's rule. That is where I take the derivative of the numerator, and then separately I take the derivative of the denominator, and I reevaluate, and I should get the same thing. Plug two in for x, I get eight minus three is five, five over one is still five. Okay, so, our limit exists, our order pair exists, but what's the third condition asking for us to do? One more condition here. For continuity, what else has to happen? These have to be what? The same, right? So we see they're not the same. F of two does not equal to a limit of our, F of our function. So we know that um, there's not going to be um, continuity. But let's talk about what type of discontinuity this is. OK, so if the second condition passes, but the third condition fails, we call this a removable discontinuity. We know that there is a hole at x equals 2. 
So visually, this is what the graph could look like here. Two seven. The graph is headed towards one y value, but it's defined at a different y value. So this is called the removal discontinuity. Um, just to kind of remind us a couple of things about limits and involving zeros. If your limit. OK, if your limit goes becomes zero over zero, you know that it's in a terminal form. We don't want to say that this is uh, undefined or or limit doesn't exist. This, there's a hole and there's more work that needs to be done. OK. If your limit goes to, let's say, um, 10 over 0, then you know that there is a vertical asymptote and that your limit doesn't exist. Okay. Unless it's a one side limit, Okay, then you got to do something extra. And then um, if the limit as x approaches c of f of x gives you something like 0 over 5, then that's a real number. Okay. So I want to make sure that we understand all the variations of zeros here and then we're not confusing one for the other, right? Zero over zero means keep going. You haven't reached, reached this. There is a solution, but you haven't found it yet. 10 over zero means, OK, there's a vertical asymptote. Limit doesn't exist, but if it's a one side limit, then you can play with decimals um, if, if, uh, if you see a this situation. If you get zero over five, you can stop and say, OK, I know the limit exists. That's a real number. It's just like if it's like two, three or five, it's just a the graph is going to go right through that point or the graph is going to uh, arrive at the same move towards the same y value from both sides. OK, let's take a look at number three. So number three, what's different here is we have two piecewise functions still, kind of like number two, but the difference here is that we have graphs that are on either side of two, not like this one, where it's a graph in the point. These are distinctly two graphs here. Got natural log extending between zero and two, and you got another graph living between two and four. So if I want to find the limit as, as x approaches two, I'm going to rely on one side of limit. Okay, I know this is not asking for the full continuity, but let's just go through the full continuity just so we can see all everything in front of us. Because if it's asking for anything more, then at least having that structure, it'll give you everything that that you that you need for a problem like this. So number three, let's say we had a function, okay, and let's just go through each of our conditions, right? If I want to find f of two. I would be looking to see where two is defined. Two is defined with the first piecewise because I see a line underneath that inequality. Okay, second condition would be okay, first condition passes, that's a real number. Second condition, does the limit exist? So to find the limit, I'm going to um, do one side limit. So approaching two from the left is for the first. And approaching two from the right is for the second. Okay, so if I approach two from the left, it's I'm just inserting that two in. It's just notation. We're not doing decimals. Okay, so plug two in for x, I get natural log of two. But if I plug two in for the x for natural log of two, I get a different number, right? Natural log of two is not thinking as for natural log of two. This is telling us that the two graphs are moving towards different y values from either side of two. So we know that if my limit, one side of limits are not in agreement, my full limit doesn't exist. If my full limit doesn't exist, then I know I must be dealing with a jump discontinuity. I must be dealing with a non-removable discontinuity. Right. And the reason why is because limit x versus two from the left of f of x does not equal to limit um, x versus two from the right. 
this is a multiple choice, so you don't have to um, write all this, all these steps out. But um, let's say this is a free response. I see a lot of students do this where they write it this way. They say the uh, one side limits do not agree and they write it in this form. I know what you mean here, but this is not quite um, correct notation. You want to indicate what limit of what, right? You want to be able to indicate the name of that function or at least reference that function. So if you just write it this form, there's something missing. You're you're not indicating what function you're talking about, even though um, that's the way we say it. We say limit, one side limits uh, doesn't equal to the other side of it, but notation wise, we need to have what function or what expression you're referring to. OK, any questions with three? OK, take a look at number four. OK, limit as x approaches pi. What's the first thing that we can do? OK, pi is a real number, so what's our first step? Yeah, always plug in, right? We don't want to assume anything. We don't know if it's a whole or asymptote or um, or if it's already a real number. Okay, so we always are trying to gather information to begin with. We don't know what's going on yet. Right? So let's replace every X with pi. OK, let's evaluate here. What's cosine of pi? Negative one. Sine of two pi is zero. So negative one plus one is zero, and denominator is zero. So zero over zero is a hole in the graph. What's our, what's our option based off of what we see in front of us? We have to go through what? L'Hopital's rule, right? This is not something that we can factor and cancel out. We're going to have to rely on L'Hopital's rule. OK, so um, we're going to go and find the derivative of each term. And take the numerator and denominator derivative separately. OK, all right. So what's cosine's derivative? Sine of 2x's derivative is. Cosine of u times u prime. Okay, the plus one goes away to zero. X squared becomes. And what does pi squared become? Zero, right? Pi squared is not two pi, right? Remember, pi is not a variable, even though it looks like a looks like visually it looks like it could be a variable. Pi is a number, so anything that's a number constant will go to zero. And so as soon as you do L'Hopital's rule, what's our next step? Yeah, plug in pi, right? See what we get. Sine of pi is zero, cosine of two pi is one, one times two is two. So 2 over 2 pi gives us reduced to be 1 over pi. Careful that whenever you see 0 over 0, that you're not mistaking 0 over 0 with non-existent. Okay? That's not the same thing. Okay? 0 over 0 is a whole. It does exist. We just haven't found it yet. We have to go through L'Hopital's rule to reach our end. Now, something that I want to point out about L'Hopital's rule that I've seen uh, students get confused with is 
L'Hopital's rule versus quotient rule. Okay, I see some students trying to go through quotient rule with this. Now, quotient rule is if I want to find the derivative of this full expression. But here, we're not finding the derivative of full expression. We're just using the derivative procedure to help us arrive at the limits. So it's a very special case where we're taking the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately. We're not getting the full derivative um, formula. It's just a derivative um, step to reach where we want to get to with limits. Okay, so it's a very specialized uh, thing where we're just doing numerator and denominator separately. And I see some students trying to go through quotient rule. That's not the same thing here. Okay, quotient rule would be if this was f of x, find f prime. Okay, then you would go through the full quotient rule: f prime g minus f g prime over g squared. Okay, so I don't I don't want us to get L'Hopital's rule and quotient rule confused. Okay, let's go to next page. Okay, number five. How do we approach a limit problem if it's X approaching infinity? Do we plug anything in or do we do something else? Okay, compare, yeah, compare exponents, right? So I have it uh, on the first page, on page 23 there. Um, if it's approaching infinity, we compare degrees, right? If the numerator and denominator degree are different, if the numerator is smaller than denominator, then your limit is zero. If your degrees are the same, then you just take the ratio of the coefficients. If your numerator is greater than the denominator, then your um, then your limit doesn't exist. Okay, so this is potentially a little tricky here. What happens when you compare degrees between numerator and denominator? Okay, same or different? I think. It looks like it's the same. But is that X to the fourth really X to the fourth? This numerator is really a degree of what? Right, what's the square root of X to the fourth? X squared. So this is really sitting at an X squared, even though it looks like the numerator has a higher degree. So these are actually the same degrees, right? So what happens when we do the same degrees? Yeah, uh, compare degrees, uh, and then we look at the ratio of the coefficients, right? So we see the, the coefficient for the x squared up top is square root of nine over one, and that's equal to three. So that's potentially a little tricky because we have to kind of understand that, OK, that X to the fourth, I see X to the fourth, but it's under the square root. So it's when everything is said and done, this really is sitting on X squared. Let me show you another potentially tricky um, setup for limit and see if you guys can, can pick this one out. Okay, limit as x approaches infinity, we're comparing degrees. What do you notice when you compare degrees? It looks like it's the same. Yeah, denominator is higher. So sometimes they may rearrange it where they're trying to get students to, not trying to, but, but seeing if students can really look at the problem closely and compare the highest degree, that you're not just comparing the first degree that comes to you, but you're comparing the highest degree. So there's a five hiding below, right? So three halves would not be the correct answer. The answer would actually be what? It's if the bottom is higher than the numerator. The bottom is growing at a faster rate, so this fraction is going to get closer and closer towards what? Zero. Right. 
If my denominator is higher than my numerator, then my limit is always going to go to zero. Okay, number six. Limit as x approaches a, remember a, uh, a here is a constant, it's the x that's a variable. So first thing we do, we're just going to insert a in for x. And when we do, we get replacing x with a, I get a minus a, replacing a in for x, I get a cubed minus a cubed, zero over zero, that's L'Hopital's rule, so I can take the derivative of the x's. Remember, a is just a constant, so it'll just drop to zero. x becomes one. x cubed becomes three x squared. So after we do L'Hopital's rule, what's our last step? Yeah, plug in a in for x. That's our answer. All right, number seven. Now we're moving on to derivatives. F of X equals X cubed over cube root of X. We see numerator and denominator, but is there a way that maybe we can avoid quotient rule? What can we do here? Yeah, good. So if this is simple enough where we can move the denominator up, then we can well try to avoid quotient, quotient rule if we can. So rewrite that denominator as x to the one third. And if I bring up that denominator, I can make this an easier problem just relying on power rule. So as I bring that x to the one third up, I can make it a negative exponent. Combine exponents by adding, subtracting, right? Where these aren't being multiplied. We got to add or subtract here. So, but to subtract, I got to find common denominator. The three is really nine thirds, right? Nine thirds minus one third. So X to the eight thirds. Okay, that's the cleaned up expression. Now I can find the derivative, find F prime. Subtract one from the exponent, eight thirds minus three thirds is five thirds. And I want to get this to match one of my answer choices. My choices are in terms of radical, so I'll bring the radical form back into my derivative. Let's see what can come out of that uh, radical or that um, x. What if I split that up into x cubed and x squared? Then it's easier to see that, okay, if I have cube root of x cubed, that just comes out as just one clean x. but we know the x squared is gonna to have to stay inside. So our answer is a thirds x cube root of x squared. Okay, number eight. Let f and g be differentiable functions, so smooth curve, with the following properties. Okay, g of x is greater than zero for all x, so that tells us that our g function is always positive. Okay. 
f of zero equals one. That's just a, a point about um, from the f graph. OK, so let's see what they get. Tell us h of x is f of x times g of x. And h prime is equal to f times g prime. So this was not really telling us anything, right? It's like, what does that really mean? Well, let's say that we were not given this information. How would you move from here to here? How would I get from h of x to h prime, given the way that this is set up? Product rule, right? So let's do the product rule just to see what we're dealing with, and we can kind of compare that with this and see why this is looking a little different than what we see with product rule. But let's build it out first, see, see everything that we need to see. So we know if I want to do, if we do product rule, because we have two separate functions here. F prime G plus F G prime. OK, so we need to do some uh, detective work here. This is what I find for my derivative, but this is what they're telling us is the derivative. So. What is missing from what we found versus what is what is told to us? The first part. So the first part is missing. What does that mean that the first part is missing? That means this is really what? It's really zero, right? It's going to end up being zero. Well, g of x is a function. So we know g of x isn't just going to disappear, which means that f prime must be what? Right, f prime is the culprit here. f prime is what's causing this to be zero because we know g of x is a, is a function, it's a differentiable function. So we know that's not going to be the issue. It's going to be this. This is what's causing this to go away. So if f prime is equal to zero, then what do you know about f of x? Yep, it must be a constant. That's the only way that a derivative for f will go to a to zero and, and completely disappear. So f of x must be a constant, which means that option A, option B, option C is out. Zero and one are both constants. So how do I know which one to choose? Is there anything else in the problem that can give us a clue as to what to choose? Which means. F of X must be what? Must be one, right? That's the only way that I can insert zero into the function and still get a one. Okay, number nine, uh, you can use uh, product rule again and uh, do um, tangent equation. And okay, so uh, this will be, I'll let this be part of your homework. Uh, your homework will be page three and four, so I'll be checking pages one through four tomorrow. Okay.